All right, well, it's great to be together again and uh, looking into God's Word. So last week we looked at Matthew 24, which was Jesus' overview of the end of the age. If you missed that class or if you want to see anything else that you might have missed, uh, visit our YouTube channel, which is HT Church. And tonight uh, we're exploring a very important topic. We're talking about the mystery of Israel's salvation. Now, remember in the Bible, the way that the New Testament uses the term mystery, a mystery isn't something that you have to figure out. It's not, you know, Agatha Christie or anything like that, Sherlock Holmes. A mystery in the Bible is something that God was hiding, actually, for a time, but then chose to reveal to his people. So it's something that God actually invites you to dig into, to see his glory and to be amazed at his wisdom. So have you ever wondered why the Jewish people are so central to the plan of God? Have you ever asked yourself why Israel, with a population of less than 10 million, a country the size of New Jersey, dominates the world headlines? To get some biblical answers, we're going to have to first explore this question. Number one, what was God's purpose in calling Israel? What was God's purpose in calling Israel? The Bible teaches us, of course, that God had a wonderful purpose in calling the people of Israel. He wanted to call out a people who would reveal him to the world. And how would they do that? Well, first, by receiving and sharing his word. The scriptures came to us, of course, through the people of Israel. So as far as we know, the entire Bible was written by Jews, was written by Israelites, maybe I should better say, with the possible exception of just a couple of books. The only two books in the Bible that might have been written by Gentiles uh, were Luke and Acts. So, And even Luke himself, we're not sure he might have actually been a proselyte. He might have been a convert to Judaism, but with the possible exception of Luke, every author of Scripture is a Jew. Also, Israel's calling would be fulfilled by them being a light to the nation. So Israel was called to be a nation of priests who would teach the surrounding nations and display the glory of God. They would do that a few ways. First, by teaching the Gentile nations about the character and the holiness of God. In other words, what is God like? What is the real God like? Number two, they would also teach the nations about man's sinfulness and our our need of redemption, our need to have God save us through the sacrificial system. This was a great responsibility and a great honor for any people to be chosen for this purpose. Consider that everything that everything that we take for granted about our spiritual life, uh, most of us in the room, I know we have a, quite a number actually of, of Jewish believers in our congregation, but most of us are Gentiles and consider, consider that our knowledge of the one true God, whatever, I, I think there's plenty of countries represented in this room tonight, right? But our knowledge of the one true God comes to us through this people. Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well, and this is interesting because the Samaritans were just about as close to the right religion as you could be without really being properly worshiping Jews, okay? And Jesus told her, you worship what you do not know. (laughs) We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. It comes to us through the Jewish people. And then part of their calling, of course, was to bring forth the Redeemer. Messiah, the Savior, would be of the seed of Israel. If you were with us when we did our course on Messianic prophecy, then you know that over time through history, we started out in Genesis, God narrowed down down over time the list of candidates, the list of possible candidates as as to who could be the Messiah. And it went through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Paul talks about the privileges that Israel enjoyed because of their calling. He says, to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, 
and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Could you imagine that, that God became a man and he chose to become a Jewish man? It's mind-blowing. Number two, let's, let's talk a little bit, and this is a little bit of historical background if, if um, you need a refresher on this or maybe this is new to you. Well, let's talk about their call and shaping as a nation. So people commonly call the Jews God's chosen people, and that is a term that is misunderstood. Uh, that is not a term that, that the Jewish people uh, have taken to themselves uh, in arrogance. Uh, God did not choose Israel because they were the best or out of any kind of favoritism, but it was purely as a matter of his grace. Now, as Christians, you think we would understand that. Because how are we saved? Are we saved out of any merit or any deserving of our own? No. We are saved by God's grace. So God chose them just because he wanted to. And he was making a point, <laughs> of course. But uh, in Deuteronomy 7, and by the way, we're going to look at a lot of scripture tonight. So I hope you did have enough animal protein today to keep you awake all the way through I will be teaching tonight all the way until the movie next Thursday, so. <laughs> In Deuteronomy 7, he says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God, and by the way, for those of you who don't know, when you see those capital letters there, in the Old Testament text, that is an indication that the writer is using the divine name of God. So, so that capital letter, Lord, means Yahweh or Jehovah as it used to be rendered. So the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Listen, the Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he would, meaning he wanted to, keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, God is our father, and like any good parent, sometimes he is capable of giving us, his children, the ultimate parent answer, which is what? Because. <laughs> Why did he choose them? Because. <laughs> Being chosen by God brought wonderful blessings, but you know that another part of being chosen as the Bible says, as a son, is that includes a son's discipline and chastisement. If you weren't God's child, he would never chastise you. He would never do what he needed to do to keep you inside the guardrails. Do you know what I'm saying? There's, um, there's a sad kind of a joke in the play Fiddler on the Roof where Tevier says to God, I know, I know we're your chosen people, but maybe once in a while, couldn't you choose someone else? So, but this story began with the patriarchs. 2.1, God called Abraham out of the idolatry of his family. He appeared to him in the city of Ur in Mesopotamia. Um, Abraham came into the land that God said that he would show him. And in Genesis 15, God makes a covenant with Abraham. So the big picture is mankind, <clears throat> still very close in time relatively to the time of the flood, begins to go astray again from God almost immediately. You have the Tower of Babel, right? And so how is God going to get his glory and his life into the world and an effective witness into the world again. He's going to start, not from scratch, he's not going to wipe out the human race, but he's going to choose one person who will grow into a family, who will grow into a nation and reveal himself in that way. So God says here, and I'm quoting from Genesis 15, then he said to Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here 
for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I've given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. So, from the very beginning of Israel's history, a, a part of that being chosen, a part of that chosenness, was that God was going to give them a special land, a place that would be a showcase for the glory of God. Because in what other place, we, we read how Paul said that to them belong the glory. What other people on earth ever had the glory, a manifestation of the, the literal glory of God's presence resident among them. Think of that. Then there was bondage in Egypt for 400 years, as, as God mentions there. God confirmed his covenant to Abraham's son Isaac and then to Isaac's son Jacob. And after Jacob had this, his own life-changing encounter with God, God changed his name to Israel, which means a prince with God. Jacob, as most of you know, had 12 sons who became 12 tribes. One of those sons was Joseph, who became the ruler in Egypt under the Pharaoh. And over time, the family of Israel uh, ended up moving into Egypt to escape famine. And once they multiplied and were so blessed and grew so greatly uh, in numbers, they were enslaved by the Egyptians. And then the Exodus 2.3, we know most of us, I'm sure, the story of Moses, how God said that he had heard the groaning of his people and was going to send Moses to deliver them. And God brought the people out of that bondage and brought them into their own land with great signs and wonders. Then God makes a covenant now with his people at Mount Sinai. So remember, this is not quite the same thing <clears throat> as the covenant with Abraham. The covenant with Abraham is personal. The law covenant, the covenant of the laws is a covenant of, of blessing, which, which creates the whole people as a society. So there are, there are promises to Abraham, right, and to Abraham's descendants, which God's going to fulfill. But then there is also the law, which is a covenant with the whole people. So sometimes I think we think, because we talk about the Old Covenant and the Old Testament, and we have to be sure what it is that we're talking about. Is that, is that clear? So don't, don't let us not confuse the covenant that God made with Abraham with the law of Moses. They're not the same thing. So God appears to the people in Mount Sinai, makes this covenant with them, and he gave them his law. And God said, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. In other words, God's saying, I have the power to make that happen, right? And you, <clears throat> and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So the law promised blessings for obedience and punishments for disobedience. In other words, it's conditional. The blessing or lack of blessing is conditional upon the people's behavior towards God. Moses told the people, Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Notice how much obedience and following that is, is a part of the blessing, right? In Deuteronomy 28, we see the punishments and curses, the so-called curse of the law, that would come upon the people for disobeying the law, and it is a frightful thing. And in fact, all of those things did come to pass, what Moses said. Moses said that disobedience would mean being under siege by your enemies. And being under siege was a terrible thing in the ancient world. It meant you were starved out, no food, no water. Um, people commonly resorted to cannibalism to stay alive. It was horrendous. And that happened to the Jews uh, twice, uh, first under the Babylonians and then under the Romans and then going into slavery and captivity. Moses said, you shall become an astonishment 
a proverb and a byword among all nations where the Lord will drive you. In other words, even their name would become a curse word. This is what would happen for violation of the covenant when God released them to judgment. And we have indication even in the Old Testament that there were going to be two exiles. There were two exiles that were prophesied to occur. So if we read that carefully, we will see that the Bible teaches us about two lengthy exiles. We've talked a bit about the Babylonian captivity, which lasted 70 years. The Romans caused a second exile, and this one was uh, more or less worldwide. Worldwide. So the old joke says that you could find Jews and Coca-Cola anywhere. And it's true. There's Jewish people in almost every country, every place of the world, the Jewish people have gone, right? But this second exile, this very lengthy exile, would begin to end in the latter days. Moses said this, when you father children and children's children and have grown old in the land, if you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything and by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God so as to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you're going over Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, the nations, that is the Gentiles, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. So we have only a handful of um, civilizations in the world which are this ancient. Okay, so we have Chinese civilization. We have Indian civilization. Both of those have about a billion and a half people. And then we also have Israelite civilization, which has... Um, one one hundredth the population of Chinese and Indian civilization, only about 15 million people. Think about that. In verse 28, there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there, from those places, you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. When you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you, when? In the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. Now, do you see the interaction there between the two covenants? This is really important. If you really want to study, if you really want to understand what is happening in the Old Testament and the New Testament, notice the difference between the two covenants. The disobedience to the covenant of the law, the law of Moses, their disobedience to the law will result in their expulsion from the land. But God will not utterly destroy them, allow them to be destroyed, no matter what they do. Why? Because he has made an unconditional promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is the point at which I usually go like that, right? Okay. Remember, too, that we studied Daniel chapter 9. So we saw that even in the midst of the good news that Daniel got from heaven, that the Babylonian captivity was going to end soon, God said in that prophecy to Daniel that another trial was coming. The angel Gabriel told Daniel in Daniel 9, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now we know that that happened in the year 70 AD. And ever since then, and actually before, uh, the Jewish people have been waiting for the full restoration of their national life and everything that goes with it. The Bible teaches us also, no, number four, that they will be regathered but in unbelief. Regathered but in unbelief. So the people of Israel would exist 
for a long time outside their home, but God would cause them to live again, and their fortunes, their national fortune, if you will, would be restored. Uh, when we look at Ezekiel 38, which talks about war of the last times, of the end times, we see God speaking to the end time enemy of Israel. Have you ever heard of, in Ezekiel, the war of Gog and Magog? Do you know what, the, have you ever heard that? Okay, so some of you have heard of that. So Gog is the person, Magog is the place, and Gog is this last, is a name for this last final evil um, a Gentile ruler who will assault Israel. So in Ezekiel 38, God is speaking, is prophesying to Gog, and he says this, in the latter years, you, Gog, evil guy, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel. So we know that um, Israel became, there was this process with the United Nations and everything, and Israel became a nation in this time period again of between 1947 and 1948, okay? So that was the first time in 1948 that Israel, that the Jewish people had an independent nation, okay, not under the control of Rome or anything. They had not been their own nation since the year 63 B.C., Okay, so for 2,010 years, they were not in control of their own national life. And of course, we know what happened, right, just in that handful of years leading up to 1948. So literal millions of Jewish people were killed in the Holocaust. And so God says, in the latter years, you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered for many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. There's a very famous newspaper, uh, a news picture from like uh, 1910, or somewhere in there, 1910, 1911, which shows a picture of about 40 Jewish people, and they're just standing there in the middle of a bunch of sand because they had just bought this land from the Arabs who were native to the place, and they had just bought this property. It's just, it's just like, you know, a couple dozen families just standing out there in the sand. And what it is, is Tel Aviv. And you see Tel Aviv today, skyscrapers, it's like the Silicon Valley of Israel, pharmaceutical capital really perhaps of the world and so forth. So. Here was a land that had been desolate. In fact, Mark Twain went over to Israel in the mid-1800s, and he said that you could walk and journey like all day and not see anybody. But look at it now. God said they had lo that land had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely, or they will by that point in the story in Ezekiel. So we see then that there will be a regathering of Israel in their land before they receive Jesus as Messiah. So you might often hear people talking about Israel returning to their land, being a sign of the last days and all that. Well, we're looking at some of the scriptures that talk about how we know that this is the case. There are other passages, of course, that tell us how they will expand the city, Jerusalem, how they'll build a temple and welcome Messiah so, and so forth when he returns. So all of those things obviously imply that there has to be a large body of Jewish people there who are able to do things and interact with other nations, right? Notice how Ezekiel 38, uh, in Ezekiel 38, God says this will happen in the latter years. Now, we've talked about it before, how people often accuse Christians of having always claimed that the last days are coming, right? Oh, you guys have been saying that for 2,000 years. Do you like my unbeliever impression? It's not, it's not, it's not very nice, but, but that is the attitude, right? Um, and yet, that's not true. The early church fathers did not expect the end to come for centuries. And even more modern theologians like Jonathan Edwards, 200, 250 years ago, looked centuries, he thought it would be centuries into the future 
um, that the fulfillment of these things would come to pass. But we, <laughs> who are alive today, we can see a nation of Jewish people that's there in the land. They have been regathered, although not yet believing in Jesus. And so because of passages like this in both Testaments, now we can know that we are in the latter years. Only now, for example, would it be possible for Jewish people to make this, their moves to make sacrifices on the Temple Mount. So, so only now, to use Jesus' uh, phraseology, only now can we suspect that the times of the Gentiles may soon be ending. All right, number five, let's talk about the time of Jacob's trouble. Is it okay with digesting all the scripture? That's why I put it all in the handout so you can go back and read it later. But before the end of the age, Israel is going to pass through one more terrible furnace of affliction. Now, we have discussed a few times right before this, we've talked about the outline of the 70th week of Daniel. So you know that a, a terrible seven-year period is coming in which the nations will be shaken. Remember that that seven years begins when Israel makes a covenant or confirms a covenant with many nations. It's a covenant which we can't be 100% sure, but most likely that agreement will allow Israel to resume their animal sacrifices. In the middle of that time, they are going to be double-crossed, I guess we could say, by the Antichrist. And that begins, as we saw last week, that event begins what Jesus called the Great Tribulation. But in the Old Testament, it is also known as the time of Jacob's trouble the time of Jacob's trouble. Now notice first with me that Moses said that evil would befall them in the last days. Not a lot of people have considered the fact that a lot of this teaching, it goes all the way back to Moses. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament, to, to Balaam uh, and his cursing of Israel and to Moses. So Moses says, gather to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers so that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to record against them. For I know that after my death, you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you and evil will befall you in the latter days because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands." This is confirmed in Jeremiah. Jeremiah very, very clearly saw uh, the restoration of Israel and the trouble of Israel at the end. So Jeremiah 30 says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaks the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write in a book for yourself all the words that I've spoken to you. For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Now these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. For thus says the Lord, we've heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor and all faces turned pale? Remember Jesus talked about birth pangs. Where did he get that from? Well, Jesus had read Jeremiah more than once. In verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. Again, similar language to what Jesus said, right? And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that I will break his yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds. Foreigners shall no more enslave them, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, look, whom I will raise up for them. Isn't that cool? Did you know that in the millennium, Jesus is ruling over the world, but David is ruling over Israel as the prince under Jesus? And we know that this is not referring to the Babylonian captivity because God is saying that once this happens, foreigners will never bother them again. So it must be re referring to the time of the end. Verse 10, therefore do not fear my servant Jacob, says the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest, 
and be quiet, and no one shall make him afraid. For I am with you, says the Lord, to save you. Though I make a full end of all nations where I've scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you. But I will correct you in justice and will not let you go altogether unpunished. And then uh, 5.3, great trouble was also foreseen in Daniel. So Daniel, uh, a couple of generations after Jeremiah, was also told about this time which would have no equal. So remember, Jesus is not just coming up. Now, Jesus could have just told us things that nobody had ever said before, and he did. But when Jesus was talking and teaching about these things, he was talking and teaching about things that Jewish people already knew. He was just put them, putting them in all the right context and order. Do you, you see what I'm saying? Because look, look at what uh, Daniel says. This is in Daniel 12. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. It's exactly what Jesus was talking about that we looked at last week in Matthew 24. Even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this riverbank and the other on that riverbank. So these are angels, right? And one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river. In other words, Daniel's like, dude is floating up there. So the angels are, for the benefit of Daniel, asking each other questions about this time of tribulation. How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? And then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time, times, and half a time. What is that? Who remembers what that is? That's... That's three and a half years, okay? Um, in case you're wondering about that, or you're scratching your head, um, Hebrew, and particularly the ancient Hebrew, has something that we don't have in our language. Whatever language you grew up in may have it, but English, ha- I'm sorry, Hebrew has a dual plural. So they have a special plural just to, to talk about two of something. Now, that sounds very complicated to me, Don't complain to me, I didn't invent Hebrew. All right, so what is being said when you see that in the Bible, it's actually time, two times, and half a time. So it's three and a half years again, which is what? Which is half of that seven year period. And he says, and this is important to God's dealings with Israel, the angel says, and when the, so it's going to be three and a half years, and when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. So you can see that neither Jesus nor Christians, the Christian church, invented this idea of an unparalleled time of trouble at the end of the age. It goes all the way back to Daniel and the earlier prophets, really goes all the way back to Moses. And the New Testament shows us this concept also in this symbolic imagery of revelation. So uh, we won't get to this until the spring, but I'm going to read you this section from Revelation 12, and I want you to see how John is seeing the same thing, but he's also seeing what's going on in the heavens while this is going on. Okay, does that make, does that make sense? So it says in uh, Revelation 12, verse 1, it says, A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her crown, a, on her head, a crown of 12 stars. So um, some of you might have been raised believing that that was a, a picture of, of Mary, the mother of Jesus. It is not. It is Israel. Uh, She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth 
so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So that is a picture of Israel bringing forth the Messiah. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for, what, 1,000 260 days. What is that? That is three and a half years. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. Now, we just looked at Daniel 12, so you can just remember where to find this stuff. It's all the 12s. It's Daniel 12 and Michael 12. What happened at the beginning of Daniel 12? When this time of trouble breaks out, what happened? Who stood up? Michael stood up. Now here he is at the exact same time frame, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. In verse 13, when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for a time, times, and half a time. He's talking about the same thing that Daniel and the others are talking about just from a different perspective. He is seeing this symbolically, Israel fleeing into the wilderness and being preserved and rescued from the onslaught there of the Antichrist. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood, but the earth came to the help of the woman. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured out from his mouth. What does that mean? We'll talk about it in the spring. Uh, then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So notice all the similar elements, including the time frame. He clearly wants you to know that this t this time frames, these time frames are all the same. It's the 1260 days. It's uh, the time, two times and half a time. It's also 42 months. It is all referring to the second half of that seven-year period. So 5.4, let's talk about this, um, this thing of anti-Semitism in the Bible. So it's in the time of Jacob's trouble, 5.4, that we're going to see the full harvest of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, if we stop and think about it, is a phenomenon that defies rationality. Only when we study the scriptures can we understand that it is a demonically inspired hatred. Now, all of this shows us that the enemy, um, you know the devil's MO, right? The enemy will inspire hatred of whatever God chooses, whatever God sets his love upon. That applies to the human race in general. It applies to all of you as believers in Jesus. And it also applies in particular to the people of Israel. And by that, I mean all Jewish people. I don't, I don't mean um, in this sense, you know, um, the state of Israel or people who live in the state of Israel, right? Because guess what? People would hate them even if there was no state of Israel. So that's a lie, right? Do you understand that? That there was no state of Israel when Hitler was here. So it had nothing to do with whether there were Jews doing something in the land of Israel or in Jerusalem. 
it had nothing to do with it. So more specifically, in his attacks against the people God chooses, the devil sees an opportunity to, to strike at God, but also to see, and we talked about this a little bit, to see if he can cause the word of God to fail. Like, what if the devil, devil were able to kill all of the Jews in the world? If he did that, then he would cause the word of God to have been broken because God has promised to preserve his people. So when the devil is thrown down to the earth, if you perceive that there, the beginning of the great tribulation, part of what makes that tribulation so great is that the devil has just been tossed out of his access to the heavenlies and has been thrown down here and confined to the planet. And he has great wrath, and he's going to act out that wrath. But you see, we know that God will preserve his people. In Jeremiah 31, he says, Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. So God says, okay, if you can like blow up the sun and destroy the earth and the seasons, then you can do that too. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, says the Lord. So God wants you to know that it is impossible because of his love and because of the oath that he swore. He will never completely cast away the people that he chose. Now, again, is this because Jewish people deserve anything from God? No. And none of us deserves anything from him either. And if you can't say amen to that, say, ouch, as you know, it's true. But whenever God chooses to love something, I think our experience will tell us, and scripture, that the devil inspires jealousy against it. Not to mention that human beings are also plenty jealous without any help from the devil anyway. But you see, this is at the heart of the final rebellion of the end of the age. We can read about that in Psalm 2. David's prophesying here. He says, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? In other words, when he's saying peoples there, he means Gentile, the Gentile nations of the world. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, which is who? You can, you can say it out loud. I won't yell at you. Yeah, Messiah against the, the Christ, against his Moshiach, it says, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. So, uh, does this make sense to us today in a way that it would not have made sense 300 years ago? Could you imagine? Could, could people centuries ago have imagined a time in which the entire world would have rejected the laws, the morality, the wisdom of God and of Jesus Christ? But there it is for you in black and white that David was prophesying that at the end of the age, the world would say, we want to burst their bonds apart and cast their cords, their chains far away from us. Don't give me the laws, the rules of Yahweh. Don't give me the teaching, the laws of Jesus Christ to live my life. It is to me, it's just chains and bonds and we got to be free of that. In verse four, is God's response. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify him, terrify them, I'm sorry, in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. So Psalm 2 summarizes this conflict at the end of the age. It is a rebellion against God. And it's a rebellion against God's choices. Do you see that? But you see, God gets to choose what king he wants, what people he wants, what nation he wants, and God gets to choose in what city he's going to place his throne. 
In fact, in the millennium, Jerusalem's name is changed to Yahweh Shammah. The Lord is there. He gets to choose. That doesn't mean that he doesn't care about other people, but God gets to choose whom he favors for a purpose, not men. God says, it's, it's Jesus I choose, not Antichrist or Muhammad. It's Israel that he chooses, not Edom. It's Jerusalem, not Rome or Mecca. So men don't like that, and they resist that choice. So guys, I want to tell you, this is an important issue for believers who live at the end of days. Will we stand for what God chooses or not? Because you see, the issue of Jerusalem and its ownership is a primary issue of the last days. And Satan desires to own and control the city of God. Why? Because God says it belongs to him. And it's special. The nations will fight over it. And they will do everything they can to keep the Jewish people out of it and trample on it in order to defy God. Look at what God says in Zechariah 12. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling to all the people round about when they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome, burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, even though all the people of the earth should be gathered against it. Think about that. So the Bible talks about this as being the controversy of Zion. Who is entitled to the city of God? Well, well first of all, God is. But then, but who, is, who does God say that that place is for? It's the throne of the Lord. It is designed to mirror God's throne in heaven, and he will have it for his people and for his Messiah and his purposes. All right. Number six. Is this interesting? I think it's interesting. Number six, let's talk about Messiah Jesus and the salvation of Israel. So what Israel will then experience right before Jesus returns is part of their final discipline before the kingdom age. Moses said it, Daniel said it, that God is going to use these events to break all pride and all resistance against God and against his grace. They will not fully understand it until the end of the age. God, of course, uses the events of the end to humble the nations, but also to humble and refine Israel, his people. So Daniel was told this from heaven. We read this a moment ago, but I want you to see a couple of these again. Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for time, times, and half a time. And when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered, all these things will be finished. Jeremiah saw this also until uh, in Jeremiah 23. He said, Behold, the storm of the Lord, wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back, look, until he has executed and accomplished the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you will understand it clearly. It will not make sense to you until you're at the end of the age. In fact, part of what God is doing is teaching his glory and teaching the nations and Israel about his grace. So in Ezekiel 39, this final cataclysmic war before Jesus returns, Ezekiel's telling us that Israel and all the nations will understand what God was doing all this time. Once he destroys their enemies, they will understand what God has been up to in history, which is so cool. Look, it says, When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and I am hallowed or sanctified in them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land and left none of them captive any longer. And I will not hide my face from them anymore, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. So at the time of Israel's rescue, Jesus returns, the Lord pours out that spirit of grace and of prayer and of repentance upon them, and they recognize who it is, and they understand 
God's purposes. And that is when, for them, the language of the new covenant comes into play. I will sprinkle you with clean water. I'll give you a new heart. All of those things that Jesus was saying to Nicodemus, right, when he talked about being born again, and Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, you are the teacher of Israel. How is it that you do not understand these things? And when Jesus was talking about the people being born again, he was talking about Ezekiel 38 and 39. He was talking about the entire nation having that born again experience and the washing of the water. So powerful. Because a lot of people are like, where, is, where does it ever say that? That's where it says that. All right, let's wrap it up talking about the purpose of Israel's fall and rise. So um, we, we covered a lot tonight, so I know it's a, it's a lot to digest. That's why there's those say laws in the Bible, right? You got to kind of pause and let it settle in like, you know, like that big first piece of lasagna before you move on to the rest of what's there. So. All right, well, you've heard of someone having a rise and fall, but Israel's unique because it has a fall and a rise. And that's the purpose of Israel's fall and rising again, so that the grace of God might be glorified and so that God can demonstrate his grace to both Jews and Gentiles. You see, God has engineered something in history so that no one is able to boast. Jews are not able to boast. Gentiles are not able to boast in terms of their salvation. And when we talk about the millennium in more detail in a few weeks, we're, we're going to talk about the glory that, that Israel will then enjoy during the millennial kingdom of Christ. But tonight, I think the best way to close this, and then we'll open it to questions, is, is to read from Romans 11, and you get Paul's overview of the mystery of Israel's salvation. So Paul says... In verse 11 of Romans 11, I say then, have they stumbled so that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. That's a rebuke right there, right, to all of us. Because if your salvation experience in your life, if your life in Christ is not sufficient to make Jewish people wonder what you've got, you're still somewhat deficient in terms of the life of God that's coming out of you. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure is riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Let me just say, uh, uh, you know, another sign of the end of the age, as much as all the political signs, Israel going back into the land and so forth, is the beginning of the taking away of the blindness. Because there are thousands. There are more Jewish believers in Yeshua now than there have been since the first century. That tells me that the veil is, is coming off their eyes. Verse 13, he says, for, for I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh, in other words, my Jewish brothers, and save some of them. For look at this, for if they're casting away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? When their eyes are open and they come to faith, that will be the point at which the resurrection of the dead occurs. Verse 25, he says, I don't, you can read the whole chapter, but I'm, I'm skipping about 10 verses there. I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. When will that be? Well, God knows. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins." So you got saved, you got born again. There's coming a day when the deliverer, Jesus, in person will be there in Zion, the actual place, and he will at that time remove all ungodliness from Jacob so that the nation will be born in a day. 
I know a lot of people have been taught that the thing in the Bible, oh, shall a nation be born in a day, that that has something to do with 1948. It does not. It has to do when Jesus comes, the nation is born, born again in a day so that it never, ever sins again so that it will never be expelled from the land again. Hmm. That, that'll hit you about 1 a.m., I think. So verse 28, concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. What does that mean? That means that God is still going to choose them, not because of any merit that they have, but because of the promise, the unconditional promise that he made to their fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God will not cut off or cancel his calling. For just as you were once disobedient to God, yet have now obtained mercy through their disobedience, even so these also have now been disobedience, that through the mercy shown to you, they also may obtain mercy. For God has committed them all to disobedience so that he might have mercy on us all. That's kind of a smarter way of saying uh, what I said a minute ago, that God designed the plan of salvation in such a way that we were all fallen and Israel fell also and needs to be restored to him. That means we're all under sin. That means no one will be able to boast. It's all the result of God graciously calling us, of God graciously forgiving us through Messiah. So when Paul finishes that thought he's been running since the beginning of Romans 9 and he blows it he does one of these and he says oh the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways are past finding out that is the most blown of a mind that Paul has actually in all of scripture and it's because he's just marveling at the ingenious nature of God's plan of salvation. So that great day is coming when the whole people will see Jesus and receive him. God says in Zechariah, they will look upon me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him. So friends, that's a very short glimpse uh, into a huge topic in the word of God. I know I gave you a big mouthful there, but, but here, here my heart, church, this is, um, this is our task before Jesus comes to pray for the Jewish people, specifically to ask God to remove the scales from their eyes. You remember the story of Paul when he got saved? He says something like scales fell from his eyes so that they can see the glory of God that is in the face of Jesus Christ. We also want to provoke them to jealousy because, because we do enjoy the glory of Christ upon our lives. We are to love them because they are beloved of God. They're not cursed and hated by God forever or all these horrible things that people have said. No, the word of God just told you there that they are beloved for the sake of the forefathers. And because of the promise that God made to Abraham almost 4,000 years ago, he will stu still do all these things for them and he will turn their hearts even if they've been disobedient, just like he saved you when you were disobedient to him and you didn't deserve it. It's the same thing. Don't make war against their choice, the fact that they've been chosen by God. I mean, you wouldn't like it if somebody said to you, well, it's not fair, you shouldn't go to heaven because you were bad. <laughs> you would say, no, you missed the whole point of the gospel. Okay, same thing, God's allowed to choose them too for his own purposes. And we need to find ways to share Messiah with them with love and sensitivity. I think this is one of the key values of the last days. It is a key part of the last day's harvest and the fullness of the church. And we want to see the full harvest brought in. That's why we're doing everything that we're doing uh, in a church that's named for the season of harvest, guys. <laughs> we want to be a harvest-minded, harvest-focused people. But a key part of this, a part that we cannot forget, is God's call to reach his ancient people. If you are a Gentile believer, this is your older brother. And we are called to love him for the sake of Messiah. Because, as Paul says, if their being cast away meant the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be? What will their reception again be but life from the dead? 
So, amen. That's what I wanted to share. And um, we'll, we'll take some questions. And um, Margaret's going first. You go ahead and ask, and I'll get a drink of water. It's not directly related to the teaching. In my um, readings in the Old Testament, it says that God says that every firstborn belongs to him, the animals and the men. So my question just, it would come to my mind, why or how would they belong to God? I know that there had to be a, a ransom paid for them to buy them back, but in what capacity do they belong to God? Like re in practical terms, like I know the animals were sacrificed or whatever. I don't know. But what about the people? Well, in practical terms, they are not standing um, in their ministry, let's say. That's what you mean. I mean, they were called by God to be a nation of, of kings and priests and to represent him to the world, right? To teach and so forth and all those, those things that I mentioned. But practically speaking, they are not standing in those offices at the moment. They will again to some degree. It's, it's kind of interesting that um, if you're a Gentile believer in Jesus, you have kind of, if I could put it this crudely, um, by, by being grafted in to Israel, we, we've gotten in on their deal. Right? The new covenant in the first instance doesn't belong to us. It belongs to them. It's their new way of relating to their God. But you see, when we, we looked at those uh, in Isaiah, we looked at those passages where God speaks to the servant, his suffering servant, and he says to the servant, he says, it is too small a reward, it's too small a thing for you just to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. And so we participate. So now in the New Testament, because of that, because we've been grafted in, Peter says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy people to show forth the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. But they currently are not standing in their, uh, they're not functioning in the ministries to which God has called them. They will again, you know, there will be, there will be service, there will be worship um, in, uh, in the millennial kingdom, and they will be leading that, they will be heading that, they will be the head and not the tail. They will have a role in the world like people would say that, you know, America has had in the last several generations and beyond. They will be in, in many real, doesn't mean that they'll be the biggest nation in the world, but, but um, they will be the center of the world, you know, in a spiritual sense, for sure, because, because we're all going to have to go there to worship the Messiah. That's where he's ruling from. Jerusalem will be the capital of the world in every meaningful sense. So the firstborn, yeah. Well, the, fir the firstborn uh, not only has, you know, a position by, by virtue of being firstborn, but also has more responsibility. You know, so God calls Israel, you know, my son. Out of Egypt, I called my son. It's his firstborn son. So there's family leadership, right? They have the leadership. They're just, they were meant to have the leadership of the human race, but they also have... The, what goes with that, hence the chastisements and so forth, you know. This is why, like in Isaiah and the ministry of John the Baptist, you know, speak words of comfort to my people, you know, tell her that her iniquity is pardoned because she has received from the Lord double for all her sins. Do you remember the firstborn got a double share? So there's a, a double blessing compared to other sons, but there's also double strictness, right? Um, is, is there a fir any firstborn in the room who has not heard, as I have, right? You should know better. 
you're the oldest. You're supposed to take care of your baby sister and watch her because you're the oldest, you're the firstborn. It's the same principle. Now, listen, um, uh, that doesn't have to do, any, that doesn't have anything to do with the essential worth of a person, of a human being, right? Because God so loved the world. Doesn't mean that he loves them more than he loves Gentile people, right? In fact, he rebukes them. God says, did you think that I had any pleasure in the death of the Egyptians? Because that's not who he is, right? But in the age to come, you know, there's actually Israel, and then he will also say, you know, uh, Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands. So everyone will be elevated, and yet they will still be, right? It's just like in human relationships, there's, um, I always like to give the example, like the, the president of the United States is not better than me. So we're both human beings, but he's greater than me because he has greater authority, you know. So, I mean, there's, there's always those um, relationships of authority in, in all human spheres and so forth. So that's just his design for them. Somebody has to be the leading nation. And, and, it's, and it's that choice that, that people don't like. So you see that demonically driven hatred. That's why, that's why I said before, it doesn't matter if there's no Israel or not. People hated Jews for thousands of years when they were not in the land of Israel. They hated them because they were Jews, not because they were, you know, uh, taking land somewhere or something or that people thought didn't belong to them. So, right. Somebody else? Frank? Maybe you want to let somebody else go first. <laughs> I'm up to seven. Oh, you have seven? Yeah. Okay. So, well, we can make you. We can make an office appointment for you. And go All right. Somebody else besides. <laughs> I'm teasing you. Somebody else besides my brother. Way in the back, I see Michelle. Okay. Um, there's a mic here, or I can get my steps in. And to those of you who are watching on YouTube, I am still in the room. I'm just walking up the center aisle, and you. I'm out of frame. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you in Matthew 15 with the woman from Canaan when Jesus, when she wanted her daughter healed from the demon. And he said, um, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Was that because I always got, because she was a Gentile. So was that the beginning? Or was that him saying that he was making a way for them? Yeah, good question. So um, the reason why he was saying that be is because he was not sent at that time to anybody except his own people, right? So that reaching out um, in a broader sense to Gentile nations was going to have to wait until the Holy Spirit was given and he sent us out sent them out with the Great Commission to go into all the world, right? So in fact, not long before he died, um, you know, Philip says, hey, um, Rabbi, there's some, there's some Greek guys here, you know, they want to meet Jesus. And Jesus says, no. <laughs> he says, unless, unless a grain of wheat falls in the ground and dies, it doesn't bear any fruit, but then if it does, it brings forth fruit. So, so in other words, He's saying after, after he dies and is raised, then there will be the time for the mission to go out uh, to, the, to the Gentile nations. It just wasn't the time yet. His role, his job at that time was to, um, to give a complete testimony to his own people um, first. So, yeah, that's a good question, sir. Yeah. So that's like yeah. A shock to me. No, that's good. I, no, it's no, it's very interesting. And I was, 
I was just I was just throwing that in for the jolt actually, but it's in there, so it's in the text. Um, yes. So what we don't we don't have all the details, but I will tell you that the amount of detail that we actually do have about the kingdom of Christ, about the millennial kingdom, there's actually a lot of detail uh, in there. There are a lot of passages. Uh, Christians just don't read them. I mean, there's all kinds of amazing things going on there, like the last nine chapters of Ezekiel. Nobody's hanging out there. Um, there's Isaiah 2, Isaiah 60. There's all kinds of scriptures about the millennium that Christians just don't read, or else they are, um, or else they are spiritualizing them away, right? They're saying, oh, that's just symbolic of the blessings that belong to the church now. Uh, no. Um, right from the beginning, we read about God when he, he first even makes covenant with Abraham the first time. He makes a land grant to him, right, that extends all the way out to the Euphrates River. Now, um, you know, Israel, I don't think, is up for that the nation of Israel now, and they're certainly not going to try to make that happen. But in the age to come, God will cause that to happen. There are a lot of things like that um, that have not yet ever come to pass. And so, and once we get into an eternal state, nobody will care anymore. It will be meaningless. So there must be this intermediate time between the way that we understand reality now and future eternity when we're all in a resurrection body there will be a time in which God will do all those things and fulfill all the promises that he made to those people. And a part of administering that is, the, and we'll talk more about this you know, when we talk about the millennium, because it has a lot to do with us as Christians too. Um, it's an interesting study how God administers all of that in history. So Jesus returns uh, and the believers of now, us, and those who are, you know, beheaded for their faith or near unto Christ or whatever, they live as well when Jesus returns. It says, and they lived and reigned with him for a thousand years. So in the age to come, you are the government. At least some of us will be. We'll be running something. You know, I always, you've, you've heard me joke, right? One of you, one of you perhaps here tonight will be the king of the Bronx. We don't know who that is, but... But that's a reality, right? I mean, if there is a Bronx in the millennium, somebody will be the king of the Bronx reporting to whoever, the king of America, and then reporting to Jesus. Jesus told the apostles, because, you know, the apostles could be, you know, a bit whiny and immature at times, like we all can. And I think it was when they had one of their what about us moments. And Jesus told them, he said, in the, what he called the regeneration in the regeneration, in the age to come, you 12, he said, will sit on 12 thrones judging the tribes of Israel. So in the age to come, whatever, there's some kind of a problem, there's some kind of dispute, uh, and the tribe of, you know, Benjamin or whatever, well, guess what? The Supreme Court is, you know, I don't know, the Apostle Andrew or somebody, right? So... More directly to your point, one of the features, apparently, from several places, there are maybe, I don't know, two or three places at least where this appears, we know that Jesus is the king, and everybody around the world will go to worship him at that time, but apparently, David is the prince. He is the prince of Israel in the age to come. So he is ruling Israel under Jesus in the millennium. So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. The comment is if, if God could still use David after, after what he did and use him that way in the millennium, then we should have hope. And that, and that, is, absol that is absolutely the case. That is absolutely the case. So, so we don't have all the parameters, but David is involved in governing. He's even involved in the temple worship. So if you, if you read, and it's, it, listen, it's, it's a very difficult study to study Ezekiel's temple. It's you know, you need like maps and charts. Okay, what are they talking about? So it's it's very tricky and because it's it's very dissimilar 
from the temples that we have in the Bible, the first, second, and presumably the coming third temple. But David is also involved, according to Ezekiel, in the temple worship, in the service of the temple. He has a special gate that he comes through and so forth that's just for him, to honor him and so forth. So uh, very interesting stuff. But he'll be prominent. Um, you know, he's mentioned so many times. He's mentioned more than anybody, I think, in, um, in the book of Revelation. So my brother, way in the back, but we need to get a mic to you so he can, you know. Well, I know, but that doesn't help the people who are watching in, in, you know, in Brazil and Malaysia, so <laughs> you're not that loud. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I feel like Bob Barker always with this. So, um, wow, that's really loud. So in reference, uh, just a follow-up to the discussion, um, the tribe of Levi used to do all of the religious matters. Who's going or which of the 12 tribes will be designated to fill that responsibility because that, in the new millennium, because that's gonna be one of the key um, components in the tribe of Levi no longer mm -hmm. exists, so. Oh, but it does exist. Well, exactly, I'm sorry, it does exist. Those right. tribes, a, those tribes all exist, yeah. right? The issue, the issue is not whether they exist, the issue is, you know, who's who, but God knows who's who. Ephraim and I believe Manassas. Or, I can't remember. It's well, those those tribes. So the northern tribes were mostly scattered, right? And very cool guys. You can go and you can search in the news, and you can see that a lot of people in other. Thank you, brother. You can see that a lot of people in other countries are claiming to have been some of the ancient Israelites, and they want to return. So there's a, a whole group of people uh, around uh, India and Bangladesh perhaps, called the B'nai Manashe. They're the sons of Manasseh. And uh, a lot of these people, just as was the case with the Ethiopian Jews, some of them held on to Jewish customs for like thousands of years, customs that are older than the Jewish people now have, customs that go back to ancient Israel. And so a lot of these people have come into Israel. So if you go to Israel, you know, it's not just maybe what those of us who live in this area think a Jewish person looks like. So you go to Israel, there's Jewish people that are, you know, Ethiopian Jews, they're Jews from, from India and so forth, uh, and many of them are, um, you know, they don't accept every claim probably, but many of them can prove that they have some descent from some of the, the 10 tribes. Now, the tribes were not all completely lost. So it's a myth to say that there's the 10 lost tribes, they're not. Even in New Testament times, there were some people from those tribes. So you remember the Christmas story, the prophetess Anna, who prayed in the temple, right? The Bible says she's from the tribe of Asher. It's one of the ten tribes of the north. So those tribes were not completely vanished. That is a total myth. It's, sell, it's good for selling books, but it's not true to the Bible. Um, in terms of the priesthood, um, there, there's two... Two things to know in Ezekiel's temple. Yes, there are Levites there, but only one family of Levites. God is judging them because there were certain families that were wicked. And so the only priests left that God uses are the priests from the tribe of Zadok. So in the millennium, the tribe of, uh, not the, the tribe, I'm sorry, the family of Zadok is the only one left. But, um, Margaret, you will find this interesting. Um, in the millennium also, not only does God use them, but God says that he will take some people who are Gentiles and he will make them to serve as Levites in his temple. So it's pretty cool, right? So he's, you know, God is, um, I suppose what we would call nowadays an equal opportunity employer. Hi, Pastor Nick. Uh, so just from listening to you, so what about the tribe of Dan? Do they still exist? Um, yeah, I think, I think they still do exist. It's, we will talk more about that when we look at the book of Revelation. But um, all the tribes exist. There is a question uh, as to why um, Dan is not listed in, some of the list, in the, one of the lists there in Revelation. But that doesn't mean that they don't exist. Um, a lot of people think that um, the Danites... Because the Dan 
tribe had a history of doing their own thing and they lived way up in the, in the north. And so a lot of people believe that they just kept going. They're just like, all right, we're out of here. So um, when Israel in the north fell into idolatry, a lot of people think that the tribe of Dan just like went up and just kept going into, uh, through the Middle East, out into, even into Europe. And it's very interesting that if you go back, uh, is, is my uh, Greek sister here tonight? I don't think she's here. But um, the ancient Greeks, I'm talking, I don't mean like Plato and those guys. I mean like way back, centuries before then, like around the time of David and Solomon. The Greeks were known as Danites. The Spartans, some people actually believe that the Spartans were Danites, that they were ethnically, that they were Jews, that they were the tribe of Dan. And um, to this day, actually, many, all the rivers in Europe in that part of the world, they are all based on the name Dan. You can check it out on the map. I mean, there's the Danube, the Dniper, and all of these rivers are all named for Dan. So a lot of people think that it went all the way. You know, you know the, um, what's the thing, right? Uh, the Trojan War, beware of Greeks bearing gifts. You've heard that? No, actually, in the original Latin poem, is beware of Danites bearing gifts is what it actually says. So some people believe that that's what happened to the tribe of Dan. But that's, it's not a problem for God, right? God knows. Uh, see, because part of what's at issue nowadays is they don't have the genealogical records of the temple. That's why they believe, oh, these things can only happen when Messiah comes back or when Elijah comes back because being a prophet, then Elijah can tell who's who. This, this type of thing. Because when the temple was destroyed, all those records and things, they were all, you know, burned and whatever. Unless they've got it hidden somewhere in a cave or something. Who knows? But So usually the only way that you know traditionally is some Jewish people have names, have a, a name, a last name that indicates that they are a priest or a Levite. So we have a brother here who has, tonight, who has a name that's based on Levi. So his family tradition probably tells him that he is from the tribe of Levi. So if your name is Levitz or Levine, names like that, you're a Levite. Now, the, the word for priest uh, in Hebrew is a Kohen. So if your name is Cohen, Jewish person, Cohen or Khan or Kohn, uh, a name like that, then that indicates usually in the Jewish community that you are descended from priests. Um, not sure about that. There's a lot of those German names, you know, it's, they could mean something in German, so it's not necessarily, yeah, not necessarily the case. But, um, oh, is it time for Frank's seven questions? Can you give us one at a time? Oh, Tony's, okay. You yield the floor? The gentleman yields the floor first. I don't want to double dip, but. That's fine. Um, but I've been thinking about this lately. Um, when we talk about the children of Israel, the 12 tribes, and people use the term Jews. Now, is not the Jews the uh, tribe of Judah? And are we just using that term loosely? I mean, uh, basically, we said before about anti-Semites, the Semites would be, would be the uh, children of Israel as well, right? Or, or does that expand farther? Can you just elaborate on that? And yeah, no, that, that is a fabulous question because there's a lot of confusion and so forth, just the way that we use language. So, so um, there is the adjective Semitic. So there are Semitic peoples and Semitic languages, right? Um, but when we use the word anti-Semitic nowadays, it's really, it's just confined to um, prejudice against Jewish people. But in terms, you make a good point in terms of the word Jew, the Jew, the word Jew, it really means it's a Judean. It's somebody from the tribe of Judah or from the place of Judah. So for the most part, we know that the tribes were not all, you know, wiped out, but Jew it just kind of became a catch-all to describe the tribes that were left in Judea, which was Judah, Benjamin, which was very small. Anyway, like, you know, Paul... Paul was from the, yes, Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin, and then you had the Levites. So you really only had like three tribes there, maybe in the land, and then a few remnants 
from the 10 northern tribes. So yes, technically, the promises are not to Jews. The promises are to Israel. And God knows who that is. So by the time when we get out into the millennium, once again, you're going to see, because God knows who they all are, you're going to see, once again, God parceling out the land. Like, here's the territory of Gad. Here's the territory of Reuben. So that is all going to happen again in the age to come. But you're, you're right. Technically, it would be more correct not to call all Israelite people Jews because properly that's the tribe of Judah. Yeah. So... Thank you for that. That's a good. I got that. <laughs> okay. I, will, I can't explain that, but I will. Uh, I'll combine. Uh, there's seven, but I'll combine three or four to one. And okay. Keep it simple. Yeah. Well, Gabriel, or someone, you know, an angel, or maybe the Lord or Savior Himself speak to us or maybe speak to a Jew before Christ returns once more? Well, I mean, you know, the Lord is doing a lot of amazing things like that all over the world. Yeah. I mean, I feel like the Lord, I mean, it's been very prevalent, as you probably know, in the Muslim world. You know, angels and even many people would say the Lord himself ha have been appearing to Muslim people, right? Angels have been giving direction to Muslim people in large numbers over the past couple of decades, like, you know, go to this city, ask for this person, you know, just, just something that we would see out of the book of Acts. So, and there are many Jewish people that have had, I think, amazing encounters with the Lord Jesus. So, I mean, these things are... You know, I mean, if he did it to Paul, there's no reason why he can't do it right. just as dramatically or right. just, you know, not so dramatically uh, in our time. And I would expect, because we're moving into that period of history, I would expect that to just continue to increase, actually. Right? God said in the last days he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh, and that includes Jewish flesh. Right. Uh Okay, because I, I, as I was preparing this, I was looking at the, the 17 prophetic books in the Old Testament. These prophets were visited or, or, you know, were told by angels or by the Lord or somebody. That's where they got their wisdom. That's where they based their prophecies on, the word of the Lord, all through the, the Old Testament. And uh, I'll combine each group here. Um, at this time, could we look for a cherub or a seraph, uh, would there be trumpets? Would there be incense uh, at this time? Would we be able to experience these, these things? Wait, do, do you mean in a visionary experience? No, it, it, at the time, at, at the end, when he comes. I, I'm not sure. Do you see all these things? Experience these things? Um, the, the appearance of angels, uh, the well, sounding of trumpets. Uh, certainly, certainly, when the Lord comes, yeah. And let's let's assume that um, that we all not only here profess Christ but confess Christ to the end. And so, let's assume that we are part of that, you know, returning army with Him. Whatever your whatever your view on the rapture may be, you will be among those armies in heaven that will be returning with Him, and that army includes angels as well as including redeemed humanity. So, yeah, but okay. I mean, that's not, that's not a worship service. That's like, that's like a smiting service. Well, I, I would like to believe that. Well, yeah, it's in, the, happen. it's in the book. Yeah, and <laughs> this is better than the Super Bowl. Where we see, <laughs> witness the dragon being slain. Will we be able to see that? Well, I don't know. It depends on... No, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be too flippant about it, but it depends on how good your, your tickets are. Because, because these, are, these are real events that will happen. Now, we're not going to be in the heavens because in the middle, as I believe it in, the text indicates, in the middle of the 70th week 
he is being thrown down from, from heaven so that he no longer has access to the heavenlies, right? We saw that in Revelation 12. And then he gets cast down to the earth. Yeah. So you wouldn't see that unless you were there and had spiritual eyes to see that happening. Okay, so you would not see that. But depending on, as I said, how good your tickets are, uh, if you were in close company perhaps with the Lord, or I don't know, the Lord could arrange the geography so that everybody could see it. Uh, remember that angels are going to bind, you know, this super strong angel is going to bind Satan and seal him up in the abyss for a thousand years. Right. And I believe that people will see that and maybe be able to continue seeing it in some fashion. So, um, you know, there is, um, yeah, because I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what his appearance will be, but it will be something that is real, that has a real effect because he will be bound for the length of the millennial kingdom. And, and, and that would be part of our salvation, part of our reward to witness this. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, right. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And you're um, going to be judging, you know, we'll be judging angels also, as, as Paul tells us. And so, um, you know, I don't know how that's going to work, but in, in some way that we don't yet understand, we're going to be responsible for delivering sentence upon rebellious angels, apparently. Yeah. Don't ask me how that will work, but it's pretty amazing. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Last. We'll, we'll get our instructions on the way in. Yeah. Do we know, when was the, the last time, I mean, all of this here we've been studying is from prophecies from the Bible, mostly from the Old Testament, and then, of course, John, Revelation, okay. Um, is there, when was the last time something like, was it John on the island of Patmos? Is that the last time someone really got the word directly from God? Um, well, yes, in the sense that there's no new scripture. I mean, that doesn't mean right. that people yeah. can't have so that was experiences really, truly with the, the Lord. the last time God... Yes, that was, as we would say, that, that the, on the, the island, on the island. Yeah, the, yeah, the closing of the canon of scripture, yes. So there is no new... It. There's no new scripture, there is no more, um, there is no visionary experience or prophetic experience that is infallible, that does not have to be judged, and that everybody has to accept as, as a matter of faith and practice, right? So, so as believers, by the Holy Spirit, I am obligated to accept what's in, right? The letters of John and James and what's in the Gospels. And, so nobody can, nobody can add to that. Right? There's no, like, the yeah, Book of Mormon, so. yeah. you, like, the Book of Mormon, we're, we're not to receive that. Because Paul said, even though we or an angel from heaven should preach to you any other gospel than what we've received, let him be considered accursed. So anybody that comes along with, like, you know, the Third Testament or whatever, you know, just show them the door. That doesn't mean that you can't have an experience with God, but it's, it's not going to be Scripture. And it's not going to be something that that others can't judge and shouldn't judge. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes, and so we have to go by the word of John and from Revelation. This is the word. This, this well, is the last scripture. So the very, word, right? can, the very word canon actually means a measuring rod. Okay, so that's what it meant. So it was the rule, like almost in the sense of a ruler. So I measure every truth by what's already in the book. That is my, that is my rule. So if I, I cannot believe something and I cannot practice something that is not supported by the Bible because that is the rule that God has given us of faith and practice, as we would say. Okay. Um, this is just an observation. This is not a question, but in my own travels, I've been witness this anti-Semitism over the centuries, many, many centuries, throughout Europe, to all the countries has taken place. Uh, and it's based on hate for sure. the sake of hate. Yep. It's just hate for the sake of hate, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. It's, the, it's the ancient hatred. That's what it is. So, anybody else? Michael.
Thank you. I don't have seven questions, <laughs> but um, just one. In, I believe it was four or five years ago uh, in Israel, the embassy was moved from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem four or five years ago, 2018, 2019. Um, what, uh, to end times, what does, is there any significance to that? And is there any reference in the Bible prophecy that that was prophesied that would happen? Um, no, I don't think there's any reference to that in the Bible, uh, that it would happen. I don't think that it has any prophetic significance other than that it is um, just illustrates the Jewish people wanting to take uh, authority over the land that they believe that God has given them and wanting others to accept that the same way that they, that any other nation would expect to have its own designated capital received, right? So, um, you know, they would say, okay, whatever disputes anybody has with us, this is our eternal capital. It's been our capital for 3,000 years, okay? Long before there was, right, a, a, a Paris or a London or a Rome, right? There was a Jerusalem and Jews were running it, okay? David conquered Jerusalem and made it his capital in 996 BC. <laughs> so my, my back of the envelope math tells me that that's like 3,020 years ago. So why would you not accept that that's their capital, right? I mean, they've been living there you know, three times as long probably as French people have been living in Paris. So, so other than other than that, <laughs> you know, I don't think it really has any proper significance. But they will not, um, whatever additional authority that they exercise over the city will be contested. So in Revelation. In Revelation 11, where it seems to outline this sharing of the Temple Mountain, it seems, um, the angel tells John, um, don't measure this outer part because it's going to be trampled on by the Gentiles for 42 months. So it's going to be in dispute. It's going to be, Jerusalem is going to be disputed all the way until, until Jesus comes back. It just, it's just going to happen. He, he talks about it as being a, a, burden, a burdensome stone. The issue of Jerusalem is a burdensome stone for the nations. In fact, in fact I think in one place it talks about a, a stone that would injure yourself. So, so what God is saying, he says Jerusalem is a big stone that will give anybody that tries to pick it up a hernia. That's like, I think, literally what God is saying. So, but he has made that the focal point of, of this controversy of the nations and inspiring all this Jew hatred, right? And it's all centered on that. And that's why it's Psalm 2. And it's so interesting that the book of Psalms begins with this conflict. So Psalm 1 <clears throat> is just kind of like an introduction, right? Blessed is the man who walks and so forth. That's the, just the introduction to the book. Once you turn the page and hit the Psalm 2, it's like, boom, the war is on. Like, immediately there's conflict, there's rebellion, there's the end of the age as, as soon as you turn the page. And the focal point is God saying, whether you like it or not, I have set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. So Zion is, you know, it's like, oh, it's a dirty word. Oh, Zionism. Oh, it's bad. No, we're not anti-Semitic. We're anti-Zionist. Really? What was Hitler's excuse, as I said before? What was the excuse of all the, the, the crusaders in the Middle Ages and all the Muslims that have slaughtered them also down through the centuries? And what was the excuse of the Persians and the Babylonians and the Egyptians? There was no, you know, there was no Zionist movement to arouse Pharaoh when he was throwing you know, Israelite babies to crocodiles. Anyway, yes, I saw Margaret, though, out of the corner of my eye, so. 
Um, a, a question I had a couple of weeks ago. When we were talking about um, the end of the times and how Israel would make a covenant with the Antichrist, and then, then like the next day, you posted on on Realm that that Netanyahu made a covenant with like so, and then we were also talking about how we really don't know when the end is. You know, it could be a long time, it could be not that long. Is it conceivable that? that you know, they're making preparations to rebuild the temple, but they haven't really started it yet? Is it conceivable that, let's say they make this covenant, you know, Israel makes a covenant with the Antichrist, even though the Antichrist isn't here yet, but, or we don't know who he is yet, but, and then within those first three and a half years, because they have like this covenant made and everything, they scramble and put together enough of the temple that they can make sacrifices that he could, um, in the middle of it, he, the Antichrist could, you know, do the abomination or whatever. Yeah, that is exactly what's going to happen because they are already they are already preparing that. Um, you can look up, um, go to the website, look up the website of the Temple Institute. So it's large, you know, organization in Israel, and they have other people, of course, in Israel. They've been working on this for years. They've been training people to do sacrifices. They have trained people to do it. They are, I, I would say, pretty ready to go. If you go to their website, you can see, Margaret, you can see all the pictures. You can see the blueprints. They'll take you on one of these, you know, three-dimensional architect flying tour and, and go through the blueprints. They have all the implements of worship according to what's in God's word. They have made the high priest crown. They have made all the bowls. They have made the silver candle snuffers. and It's all been made already. So when this is, so just, it's, I don't know, it's like templeinstitute.org or something like that. You can subscribe to their emails and read their Facebook page. I mean, this is the day we're living in, right? So um, they come out with articles and videos and things all the time. They show you priests, so-called, and dressing in their things and killing a lamb. I mean, they're, they're doing it. So um, we don't know what shape the agreement will be, but it's, I think it has to be something beyond these little agreements. Not that they're little. I mean, they're significant considering the hatred, right? But all the agreements are like, okay, we're going to do trade. Okay, we're going to do some tourism. Okay, we're going to let you fly over our country and we're not going to shoot you down. I mean, those are big steps in that part of the world, but it's not the same thing. So whatever this is, apparently, is, is strengthening a covenant with many nations. So is this going to be a big thing with like Israel and 25 people or nations in the area that allows for that sharing of it? Somehow it's going to happen. And when that does happen, they will be ready to go very fast. Maybe they won't, as I think I've said before, they, maybe they won't build a whole, so maybe before Jesus comes, you will never see something like Solomon's temple built again, but it doesn't have to be because they can construct a tabernacle, right? I mean, they had a tabernacle in the desert. They had a tabernacle at, at um, what do you call, um, Shiloh and, you know, other places um, before the temple, centuries before the temple was even built, so there's no reason why, if they've got, which we know they have, this red heifer, they can take the ashes of the red heifer, sanctify the place. They can only be on that spot. It can't just be anywhere. It can only be on the Temple Mount, which is why that geography is so important. But who knows? Maybe it, could, it would take them 30 days, 60 days, 90 days to construct a tabernacle that would look just like what's in the book of Leviticus, and then, you know, they, they, the priest, they, they have a priest and they make the sacrifices and that's it. They start. And some people believe that the way that the, there's, there's counts of days and so forth in Daniel and it's extremely complex, but some people believe that you can determine from that exactly how many days in they will start doing the animal sacrifices. But, you know, if you were alive then, all you would really need to know is when the abomination happens. And you would know that that's the midpoint. Jesus told them, look, that's the sign you're looking for. 
So forget, oh, there's going to be a war. Da, 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 da. Jesus said, no. So know this, that when you see that, then if you're in Judea, flee to the mountains. So that's what he wanted people, if, uh, Jewish people especially, that were living in the land at that time. That's what Jesus wants them to focus on because that's, that's the unmistakable sign that, that we're just about at the end of the age. We're just about at the end of the age tonight. Anybody? You, really? <laughs> Uh, Luke was not a Jew? We don't know. Oh, we he, don't know. he might have been. He might have been a, a convert to Judaism, a proselyte. Oh, but most people suspect that he was, you know, a Greek, so forth. Oh. I mean, he's got, a, he's got a Greek name. I mean, others of them did too, but, um, but, but that's, that's always been, Luke has always been the guess. Okay, if there were any books that were not written by Jews, it would be Luke, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I saw Sunday um, during the virus shutdown, travel, so on. The archaeologists in Israel have uncovered what they now know was the real meaning of the Last Supper. They got from Yeldasha and the tomb. They were able to do this because there was no more no tourists mm -hmm. for the last couple of years. Yep. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really hear. So Frank was saying about uh, God bringing good out of evil. So during COVID, the archaeologists were able to dig up a lot of important stuff that they haven't been able to dig up it before. Is, so, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Enjoy. Oh, you had a question? Okay. <laughs> Is that what that means? Okay, you were, were you doing some ASL to me? Okay. All right. God bless your friends. Thank you.